So can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm a professor in uh, Earth and Environmental Sciences, which is what the more modern name of what years ago would be called a geology department. And uh, it's good to have that change name because, in fact, we do a broader spectrum of Earth sciences now. I, I don't consider myself a geologist at all. Um, and so uh, I'd like to thank Roy for inviting me here and just give thanks also to everyone who makes this uh, possible, especially uh, the, the physics department in general. As Roy mentioned, I am an alum, so I'll just you know, prove that. So uh, Professor Yukio Tamazawa is sitting over there. I took quantum mechanics from him. <laughs> Professor Alan Krish is sitting there. I never took a class from him, but I did take a class from his wife, Jean Krish. I spent a summer working with Professor Akerlof sitting over there. And I also remember the huge excitement in the department when Professor Vandervelde he talked about signals of the supernova in his uh, tank. I'm not describing it very well, but you know, supernova. It was great. Uh, so anyway, so I am an alum of physics, and now I use physics to study the ocean. And my main tool is really big computers, as you'll hear about. So here's an outline of the talk. So I am going to start with a digression and talk a little bit about my outreach passion, which is capacity development work in Africa. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, the importance of ocean modeling in general. And then I'll have some background slides, so a few concepts that are important for the talk. So I'll talk about spectra, which uh, are used in many fields of physical science, and then just very generally about how supercomputer models of the ocean work. A very important source of data on the ocean called satellite altimetry, which is often either compared to or assimilated into ocean models. And then we'll have a few demonstrations of periodic motions or predictable motions. You can kind of tell what's coming just by looking there, um, as well as chaotic motions, which are much harder to predict. And part of the point is that if you want to predict chaotic motions, you have a very short time scale over which you can do it. And for an ocean model, what you have to do is assimilate real data to do a forecast, which is accurate over a fairly short time period before you start losing that predictability. So I'll talk about all that. And I'll show some animations of what the simulations look like and the satellite altimetry. And then I'll pick one topic, which happens to be my main research topic, uh, something called internal tides. I'll explain what that means when we get to it and internal gravity waves. And those have mixtures of periodic or predictable motions and chaotic or unpredictable motions. Uh, and I'll talk about the synergistic relationship with satellite altimetry, where the satellite data is ingested into the model, uh, but also the models are used to interpret the altimetry. I also want to mention one other thing before I start. I think this is the first time I've given a science talk at which my girlfriend, Jennifer, actually was able to come. Uh, she, works, um, she works for the city of Detroit, so, you know, uh, long commute every day. Um, okay, so capacity development in Africa. So just a few slides on that. So I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana, um, and since 2015 I've been returning every year to run a roughly one-week coastal ocean environment summer school. I just want to show a few slides there. So. It all started, well, again, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer a long time before 2015. Um, so this is me um, in 1992, and these are the Form 5 science students that I taught. I taught more students than this, but these are the ones I knew the best. And there were many good students there, but two in particular stood out, Joseph Ansong, who's here, and uh, Adam Utokilu, who's here. And so 16 years went by, and I had lost touch with all of them long since lost touch with them. But then they started writing me 
oh, this is what I'm up to, this is what I'm up to. So I started wondering, you know, what about Joseph Ansan, because he was the best student. And it turned out, totally unbeknownst to me, he was getting a PhD in applied math, studying internal waves at the University of Alberta. It was a long path for him to get there from Ghana, but he was studying a related topic. So I hired him into my lab as a postdoc. There he is in 2016. And he was there for six years, and now he's back in Ghana as a faculty member. I'm going to see him uh, this coming week at an ocean meeting in San Diego, which I'm flying to today. We still collaborate. And in the meantime, having him in my lab made me realize I wanted to do more in Ghana. So we founded this school. So in 2015, it was fairly small. We had four people uh, come from the US. We only gave lectures. We had about maybe 40 people in the audience and we handed out certificates. It's very, very important in Africa for everyone to get a certificate, um, at least in that part of Africa. So then in 2016, we got some more funding actually from this university and we held a much bigger school, about 100 participants, and we did more, not just lectures, but also field trips and labs. And then in 2017, we continued to be bigger and then we went out on a boat and uh, pretty much everyone got seasick. Um, which, is, uh, as mo us modelers like to say, that's a good reason to be a modeler. Um, <laughs> then in uh, 2018, we added uh, research topics, so a small number of the participants, instead of listening to lectures, actually did one-on-one -on -one, uh, projects with uh, the Western instructors, and that expanded last year uh, to the point where there were several projects and they all got a chance to show their results. And we're going again this year. Uh, it's a, a challenge every year to find the funding, but somehow we managed to do it. But I just think it's really important because I'll just say one last thing. So um, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but in maybe 30 years, um, a huge percentage of the young people in the world, are, the working age people, are going to be in Africa. So it's really, really important to get them more involved in science uh, for many reasons, economic development and science itself, you need for oceanography to take measurements around the world, you need people all over to do that. Okay, so now back to the main topic. So uh, here's a, a text heavy slide, I'll try not to have too many of those, um, on the importance of ocean modeling. So the ocean is important for climate. So water has a large heat capacity, so it stores a lot of heat, it moves a lot of heat around, it exchanges heat with the atmosphere, as many of you probably know, hurricanes are uh, due to the latent heat release of evaporated water from the ocean. Um, so that's one of the main reasons we care about the ocean. But there are many others. Fisheries, don't need to say much more about that. Preparing for field and uh, satellite missions. So this is a big part of what we do. Um, a mission is about to go up, either a field experiment or, or a satellite mission, and they want to have an idea of what they might see uh, and so they use models. As I already mentioned, we assimilate the, the data into models. So that's part of what enables us to do forecasting of the ocean is that we're assimilating uh, data into it. And then it's a two-way street. You interpret the data with the models. Um, so I already mentioned ocean forecasting. So just like you can uh, forecast the weather, you can forecast the state of the ocean, as you might imagine. Navies around the world are really interested in this. So um, one reason is that just like when you're in an airplane and you fly over a, a mountainous area and the plane goes up and down like this and they say we have turbulence, well, that kind of stuff happens in the ocean too. The internal waves that I'll talk about, they move up and down. So if you're in a submarine, you can be lifted up 100 meters and down 100 meters in places where those waves are big. Um, and and modeling those waves is my specialty. Um, and so another reason the Navy cares about that is that the speed of sound is a very sensitive function of temperature and salinity. And so when those waves move up, and, and these are waves not at the surface, by the way, they're at interfaces deep down. So you have um, light water here and heavy water here and interfaces between. That interface moves up and down. That means it's pulling cold water up then pushing it back down, and so the speed of sound changes. And so, um, and so, so it affects any submarine warfare in both directions. You're trying to find their subs and hide from their subs. That's actually the main reason the Navy's interested in this kind of modeling. So 
That's national security. Um, and then another thing about the modeling that we do is it gives clues about where ocean energy dissipates. So the waves that I'll show you, just like waves on the surface, do eventually turn over and break. And the models that we run do not have enough computer power to model that breaking process, but they at least tell you where the waves are, which is a start to figuring out where they might break. Okay, so here's some background. So one concept that'll come up in the talk is a spectrum. So a spectrum is a plot showing the amount of power in different frequencies or wave numbers. And I realized as I was looking through this, I should have had an example right on this slide. So I'll kind of skip ahead and then come back. Um, here you go. So this is a temperature variance spectrum and it illustrates what I was just saying a minute ago. So this is the x-axis in cycles per day, that's frequency. And this is a log axis, so 10 to the zero is one and this is two. So I hope you all know there's something very important that happens in the ocean at two cycles per day, that's the tides. And so this is the tidal peak right here. So, um, so you can see in this, that this is the amount of power per frequency and at two cycles per day you see the tidal peak. So that means that those, those, interfacials, those interfaces are moving up and down, they're bringing cold water up and pushing it down at a tidal frequency as well as other frequencies. Uh, and so you see that in the spectrum. So then these are uh, lower frequency motions and these are higher frequency motions. I'll get back to that later. But this kind of concept is used an awful lot in my field where you look at the amount of power per frequency and you can also look at the amount of power per wavelength, which is the inverse. You can look at how much power there is in little small motion, high frequency motions versus large low frequency motions. For instance. Um, I hope that was reasonably clear. Um, and now the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is, is actually the supercomputer models that we use. So uh, some words and some pictures. So realistic models of the ocean as opposed to idealized ones. You can run idealized ones where you say, let's pretend the ocean is a box and that's fun. But if you're, and I like doing that too, but if you're running a realistic model that's supposed to look like the real ocean, you're going to have seven equations. So there's going to be three equations for momentum. So you know, F equals MA type equations for what's happening to the velocity in this direction, this direction, and the vertical direction. So in the horizontal direction, you have forces due to the rotation of the Earth, the Coriolis force, you have pressure gradient forces, there's friction forces, things like that. In the vertical direction, the most important force is gravity. So that's the momentum equations. Then you have equations for how temperature and salinity evolve. So in other words, if a parcel of water is moving around and it's at the surface and it rains, then it's not gonna be as salty. If it evaporates, it's gonna be more salty. If there's heat exchange, then that parcel could cool off or warm up depending on which way the heat's going. There's also an equation of state. And so that basically tells you the density of seawater as a function of temperature and salinity and pressure. And it's way, way, way more complicated than the ideal gas law. Really complicated equation of state that basically people make their entire career out of looking at the physical chemistry of seawater and figuring out exactly how that works. I am not one of those people. It takes you, you, if you choose to do that, then that's what you're going to do your whole life. Um, then uh, there's also mass conservation equation. That's maybe easier to understand than it sounds. So suppose you have tidal currents going like this. That means sea level is going to go up. If tidal currents are going like this, then sea level is going to go down. That's essentially mass conservation. So if you count these up, three, four, five, six, seven equations, and you have seven unknowns, the three components of vector velocity, so east, west, north, south, and vertical, you have the density and then the other thermodynamic variables. So in principle, you can do this. And so then these equations are discretized onto a numerical grid and the number of grid points that you can have depends on how big your computer is. So I wish I could find better pictures of this, but um, I actually had a hard time finding these. But you can kind of see here, if you just Google it, um, that you're taking the ocean here and you're putting a grid on it and you're having points at all these different spots. And so um, at these different spots, you're solving those equations. So you can just imagine that if you want to have a lot of points 
then you can resolve finer features, but if you have a lot of points where you're solving those equations, you have to have a bigger computer. So basically, the bigger your computer is, the more points you can pack in, and it's basically, you know, the world is this big, so if you have 9,000 points, you can resolve features of, you know, 2 pi r divided by 9,000. If you have 18,000, you can resolve features that are smaller, and so the bigger computer you have, the more points you can so just to give you an idea, the biggest ocean model uh, that's been run was run by NASA on uh, these computers right here. And um, it has 17,000 grid points in the uh, east-west direction. So it's 1 48th of a degree. So 360 degrees times 48 is 17,280. Then it has half that many points in the north-south direction because there it's only 90, sorry, 180 degrees. Um, instead of 360, and it has 90 levels in the vertical. So that's about as big as you can do. And doing that run requires that you parallelize the code and put it onto something like 70,000 cores. Each one of those cores is not really any more powerful than the core in this laptop, but you have 70,000 of them. Um, and for those who know these things, the amount of data that was uh, produced by that run was 3,000 terabytes. Um, and if you're a postdoc working in my lab and you have to analyze 3,000 terabytes, which does actually happen, it, it actually is quite time consuming. And so uh, I don't know if this Saturday morning physics has had people doing data science, but that's actually a huge area in science right now. What do we do with these massive data sets? One other thing about this computer is that for any of you who have ever been in here, you'll know this is true. When you go into these really big supercomputer rooms, it sounds like a jet plane. It's really, really loud. Um, and so you have to wear uh, ear protection if you're in there. Okay, so that's a bit about the computers that we run. Really big computers, which tend in this country to be at places like NASA, and uh, the Department of Energy actually has the biggest ones, the Department of Defense, and so forth. Uh, then satellite altimetry, a little bit about that. So this is an instrument that um, currently what we have is, is these, these guys, so they're called nadir altimeters, and what they do is they just work based on the principle that you send a microwave pulse down to the surface and then it returns, and so basically if you have a high tide, it's gonna take less time to return, and if you have a low tide, it's gonna take more time. It's a pretty simple principle. And you can see that the, uh, the, the accuracy is a few centimeters. Um, and that accuracy is spread across a whole spectrum. So if you're looking at a particular wavelength frequency combination, you could have a much uh, better accuracy than that. Um, okay, so the, these measure the ocean along one dimensional tracks. They're just flying around the earth and orbiting the earth and they get data along tracks. But uh, here's a website for a mission that I'm on, which is called Surface Water Ocean Topography. And I'm actually not very good at explaining the details. There's professors in physics that could do it better, but these swaths that you see, they're going to measure um, those things. Um, they're, they're gonna measure water height uh, actually using interferometry. And so they're gonna measure the ocean in two dimensional swaths instead of one dimensional tracks, and it's gonna have a higher accuracy. Um, uh, it's, the, if, it's technical, but if you look at the wave number spectrum, um, what's called the noise floor will kick in at much lower scales. So it's gonna see smaller scales um, in two dimensions instead of larger scales in one dimension. And because of that, it's actually a hydrology mission as well as an oceanography mission. So the, the, the hydrologists are going to get water levels at, if, if I remember right, about 50 meter pixels. So the entire earth are gonna get water levels at 50 meter pixel accuracy. Say it's going to be the largest download of data that NASA's ever done. There's going to be a terabyte of day of information on water levels on land and also over the ocean. Um, and so if you look at the science team project, so these are the leaders of it. And if you scroll down here, you can see little old Brian right there. Um, so that we think this mission is going to be really exciting, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, continuing to work on that. All right, so now I want to do some demonstrations of predictable and unpredictable motions. So, um, so this is a, a spring, obviously. So the, one of the canonical uh, predictable motions is the simple harmonic oscillator. 
we've all seen that. So that's pretty predictable. Um, you have this, you know, the spring constant, and, and um, from that you can predict the period. Um, so then another canonical uh, example of a predictable motion is a pendulum. And here we have two of them, and hopefully I'll do this well. Remember, I'm a modeler. Um, so if you do it at, let's see, I'm going to try to do this around the same amplitude. And you can kind of move in tandem for a while. So this is showing that uh, if you have a linear predictable system, if I had moved it exactly the same amount, then you know, these would be moving in tandem as well. Um, so that, these are predictable motions. Now, um, there's also uh, less predictable motions in the world, and uh, I hope I do this. What we want to do, we want to... Um, what you'll see is that very quickly, um, they're moving in very different ways. Um, so um, this is something that you, if, you tried to, if you tried to do a linear analysis, you, it, it would be um, It's not as predictable. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and that has to do with the fact that there are nonlinearities in the system. And so, and uh, I'm a little nervous saying all this because Professor During here would explain this better than me. But, but uh, a professor at MIT named Ed Lorenz showed that if you have a nonlinear system, it's very, very sensitive to initial conditions. And so if you have uh, a system and if you have two identical systems but the initial conditions are just a little bit different, then over some period of time, the, the, the motions actually become very different. And that period of time is, is, is known as the Lyapunov uh, time. And, um, and that's essentially why weather is not really predictable beyond something like two weeks. Okay. So that's really important for a field like oceanography because, or meteorology because what it means is that if you want to predict a weather system a few days in advance, then you need to have a computer model because your observations uh, now are not going to tell you exactly what's going to happen two days from now. So you need to have a computer model to project that. But that computer model isn't going to have any validity unless it's initialized with today's observations. So this is what we call data assimilation. So you, you take the measurements of what the weather's doing right now and you put it in a computer model and the computer model tells you this is what it's gonna do two days from now. And you can believe that because you, you've assimilated that data. But once you start talking about what is it gonna, what's gonna happen two weeks from now, then just any little measurements that you have of that system, any, sorry, any measurement errors of that system, the errors grow and suddenly you just can't predict what's happening anymore. Charlie's nodding, so I think I'm doing reasonably well. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, I forgot to ask Charlie this, but were, did they make this for you? Okay, so this is uh, the Lorenz water wheel. So, um, and I, I think the story here, so Ed Lorenz was actually a meteorologist and he's the one that discovered this sensitivity to initial, or rediscovered is probably a better way to say it, this sensitivity to initial conditions. And then uh, Professor Willem Malkus uh, came up with this. This is a, um, a, a, a demonstration of nonlinear chaos using equations that are very similar, perhaps even identical in some way to the ones Lorenz used. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, let's see, turn it on. What you'll see is that this system becomes pretty chaotic pretty soon.
So I'm going to show you oceanic motions that in some sense are like this. You know, the tides, they're predictable. And then I'll show you others that are more like this. They move around in less predictable ways. And if you want to predict them, you can do it for short time scales if you assimilate data on them. Um, so let's show some animations. So I'm going to show some animations first of a model that the Department of Energy ran on Japanese computers some time ago. They have, now they have a new, so the, the oldest ocean model is called the Modular Ocean Model, or MOM. So of course this one was parallel ocean programs so that it could be called POP. And um, they have a new model now called MPAS Ocean. Um, so, but that doesn't matter. I'll show you this. So this is, this is gonna be a simulation showing um, what the ocean looks like, what an ocean model looks like if it's forced only by the atmosphere. So you have winds blowing, which drives currents, and you have air-sea heat exchange, which uh, gives you the temperatures at the sea surface, controls them, and then you have evaporation and rainfall, which controls the salinity, and the temperature and salinity control the density. I'll show that one first, and then I'll come back to the one at, one at a time. So that's this one. This is what an ocean model looks like if you have only, um, only the atmospheric forcing. And it was run on a Japanese supercomputer. So the colors represent temperature. So you have the warm tropics and the cold polar regions. And these contours are sea surface height. And uh, they're obviously exaggerated. They're only about a meter. Um, and so these little spinning eddies are kind of the ocean equivalent of atmospheric weather systems. So there's very strong currents in certain spots, uh, here off Japan, for instance, and here off Southern Africa. There's reasons for that I won't get into. And just like the strong jet stream in the atmosphere, can, you can get spin-off eddies from that, which are atmospheric weather systems. You can also get spin-off eddies from the strong currents in the ocean, and there they are. And so, these motions here are chaotic. They, they uh, are predictable in the ocean on time scales of maybe 30 days. So again, if you want to know where that eddy is going to be 30 days from now, you've got to tell the model, here's where it is now. You might be able to predict it for about 30 days. Anyway, that's what the ocean looks like if you just force it by the atmosphere. And um, this is what the ocean looks like from real data. So this is satellite altimetry data. So this is the second bullet here from Li Fu, who's um, one of the program leaders at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. So the, remember, this is the satellite altimeter that measures the difference in sea surface height. And it's actually measuring a deviation from the average. But um, you can see all the little spinning eddies, just like you saw in the supercomputer simulation. You have them in the real ocean as well. One other interesting thing, if you have a good memory, if you look at the date here, something big happened in the tropical Pacific in 1997. There it is. So this is an El Nino right here. I don't study El Nino, but I, you can't help but just point that out. El Nino, and I, I did go to California and experience drenching rains during that El Nino. Um, okay, so that's a bit about chaotic motions. So then, um, oh crap. Um, now I want to show you some tides. Sorry about that. Um, so this is what happens if you take a two-layer model and force it by tides. So M2 stands for moon twice daily. That's the principal lunar semidernal tide. And this is the, um, uh, here is the sea surface height. So that blue is, is negative, so that's a low tide. Red is positive, so that's a high tide. And so those are the tides. This is much more predictable. So again, the first movies I showed are the unpredictable motions, and this is much more predictable. Now associated with the sea surface height going up and down is tidal currents. And when those currents flow over topographic features, such as Hawaii, that causes vertical motions. And if the ocean is stratified, like I said, then, then the interface moves up and down at a tidal period. And that's what you're seeing here. So this is the interface moving up and down at a tidal period due to the vertical motions caused by currents flowing over bumps like Hawaii. Hawaii is just a really big bump. 
in an ocean model. Um, and so these, these are highs and lows of the interface moving up and down. This is the thing I was saying that a submarine would be taken up and down. It affects the sound, speed of sound and all that. So, that. so this is what a model looks like if you only force it by tides. All right, and then, then what happens if you take a model and force it by both? Well, that's, you'll see that here. So this is the Navy prediction model forced by both tides and atmospheric models. So basically, until we came along, people either ran tide models or models forced by the atmosphere, but no one had ever run models that were global, high resolution so that you get all these fine features, and simultaneously forced by the atmosphere and tides. That's the biggest achievement in my career, and we published it the year I came here, and we keep working on it. So um, you can divide the sea surface site up into steric and non-steric motions. I won't explain what those mean, but just a way of dividing it up. But um, this, this non-steric is shown at the bottom, and that's basically those big blobs moving around very rapidly. That's the large-scale tidal signal. Then if you look at the steric height, you see this small scale texture here. That is the sea surface height signature of the internal tide. So that's much smaller scales, small signal at the surface, more predictable. Uh, and then you have the, the, the vortical motions here, which are lower frequencies. So those are the spinning eddies. So if you know what you're looking for, you can see in this, that, oh, there's the vortical eddies, which are chaotic. There is the large scale tide, which is predictable. This high frequency stuff is the small scale tide, which would be predictable, except that it interacts with these eddies because this thing has a smaller horizontal scale. It interacts with this, and so therefore the internal tides become a mixture of predictable and non predictable. Uh, all right. So I'll just finish by uh, uh, talking about some of our, oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, I like to show this slide. I'm kind of proud of this because Richard Ray gave a talk uh, a, a few months ago. Richard Ray is the world's leading expert on analyzing tides. And here's his summary of that paper of mine that I just told you about. See, it's concurrent simulation of the eddying general circulation that's driven by the atmosphere and tides. We published it in 2010. And what he's saying is before this paper, there was a brick wall between tide models and general circulation models. So tide models tended to treat the ocean as a homogeneous fluid, no weather, no climate. Let's just assume there's tides and that's it. And general circulation models ignore tides. But then we put it all together as I showed in that simulation a minute ago. So I, I mentioned that tides in altimeter, there's a synergistic uh, um, relationship. So one thing is that the sea surface height has El Nino and it has those spinning eddies, it has strong currents, it has tides, they're all happening at once. So not, not even a lot of oceanographers understand this very well, but you wouldn't be able, that, that movie that I showed of the altimeter that showed all that stuff, you wouldn't see those other motions very clearly unless you had subtracted the tides out first. So the tides are the biggest part of the signal. So from the point of view of the rest of oceanography, their noise, you have to get rid of it. A famous saying in science, one person's signal is another person's noise. So tides are definitely noise if you want to use satellites to look at all those other things. So you need tide models to do that. Now, as I mentioned, the next generation altimeter, this mission that I'm on that's going to launch in 2021, that's going to see much smaller scales. So if it sees smaller scales, that means the smaller scale tides have to be subtracted out if you want to see everything else. Uh, and so you, you need models like ours to do that. So that's where we get into the global modeling of the internal tides and gravity waves. So the internal gravity waves are gravity waves that are internal to the ocean. So um, like this. So you, ha you have light layers over heavier layers, and this interface moves up and down. And as I mentioned, this, this interface moves up and down. It takes cold water up puts warm water down so you can see that in a temperature signal. Um, I think I'll skip that slide. Um, and so if you look at an example temperature variance spectrum, I already showed this before, this is the frequency in cycles per day. So at two cycles per day, 
That's the twice per day tidal peak. This low frequency stuff out here is dominated by those vortical eddy motions. And then out here, you have something called the Garrett Monk spectrum, which is there the internal gravity wave spectrum. So um, internal gravity waves are just, um, they're waves on these interfaces that move up and down at very high frequencies. Internal tides are internal gravity waves, but not all internal gravity waves are internal tides because there's also higher frequencies. These higher frequency motions can be seen here. So this is another one of those things you kind of have to know what you're looking for. But this is a spectrum, which again, as I mentioned before, is how much power there is at different frequencies. And the black is from real data. That's from a mooring sitting in the water measuring a time series of temperature, then you convert it into a frequency spectrum. You see the tidal peak, you see all the power at very high frequency waves out here. And then these are all computer models. And so we published a paper showing that, and again, it may not look like much, but we showed that if you go from the cyan, where the grid spacing is this, to the um, magenta, where the grid spacing is doubled, then this spectrum moves up a little bit and it gets closer to the real answer. And it may not seem like much to go from here to here, but this is a log scale, so it's a bigger. And then that really big NASA model, they start off at red and they increase the uh, computer power and they go to blue, and then they have the biggest model that's ever been run and they go to green. So the biggest model we can ever run, it's this good. It's still deficient, but it's at least closer to the, to the right answer. So we're getting the models, we're propping them up uh, to closer to the right answer when you have a bigger computer. And again, it may not look like much, but just the discovery that we made and others later that you could do this actually surprised a lot of people. They didn't think you'd ever even be able to do this well. Um, okay, so a little bit more about um, detecting tides in altimetry. So this is real world altimeter data. This is a track in the Pacific Ocean. That's Hawaii right there. This is latitude. And you're showing the M2 amplitude along the track. And you can see that there's this large scale envelope, this thing here, that's those large scale blobs traveling around. Then superimposed on that, you have the small scale stuff. That's these things. That's the, that's the sea surface height signature of the internal tide, which has much smaller horizontal scales. So if you know about data processing, you, you, can, you can get this part out, the small scales, by doing what's called a high pass. So you basically just get rid of the large scale and you're left with this. Okay. So if you do that with real world altimetry on a global scale, you get this map. And you do that with the Navy model, you get this map. Now, um, there are some branches of physics where you can measure things down to nine decimal places. Physical oceanography is not one of those branches. Um, so for physical oceanographers, this degree of agreement is actually pretty good. We're pretty happy with that. You can see that those wiggles, those perturbations to the sea surface site due to internal tides are basically similar in the two. And uh, there's some details I won't get into, but the ratios of the energies in this to that are of order one, and we're actually fairly happy with that. Um, and now, if you assimilate data, you can do even better. So here, you can see that the patterns are similar, but if you want to correct the altimeter data so that you see everything else, you have to have the wiggles in exactly the right spot. And this shows that we actually have a surprising amount of skill in that. So these are various altimeter tracks in a spot around the Southern Pacific. Um, and the red wiggles are from the altimeter and the black wiggles are from the latest and greatest Navy system. And you can see that in a lot of places they kind of are pretty close to being on top of each other, not always. And this is amplitude and this is phase because a periodic signal has an amplitude and then a time signature. And so, for those who know what these numbers mean, 64% uh, of the variance in the red is captured by the black. 
And so what that means is that when this billion dollar satellite goes up, and this is gonna be their biggest problem, we wanna get rid of this so that we can see all the other small scale motions in the ocean. This means that our Navy model could be used as a correction model. It's probably not the best correction model. The best thing to do is probably just analyze the data itself, but it's, going, it's definitely the best dynamical model for doing that. And the reason it can do this well is because it's assimilating data. Um, and that data, it's assimilating the eddies and that affects a lot of processes that affect even the more predictable motions. Okay, so um, another thing is I mentioned is that the, um, the internal tides interact with the mesoscale eddies and so some of the energy will become less periodic. And this plot here, uh, done by, in a paper by my postdoc who just published it, um, shows that again, the general geographic pattern in the model, which is shown in the top three plots is similar in some sense to what's seen in the data. So what this is showing, it's a little technical, but it's showing how much of the variance of the internal tides is not predictable or non-stationary to be more exact versus the total variance. And um, so in other words, if, if you can write something as an amplitude, cosine, omega t minus phase, so you have an amplitude and a phase telling you when do you have a high and a low and how, what's the amplitude, that's the stationary part. But there's also in that same frequency band, there's a bunch of stuff that's, there's a certain amount of energy that's not predictable because those unpredictable eddies are interacting with it. And so our model can get the gross patterns of uh, how much is unpredictable versus predictable, it, you know, at least I would argue that based on these plots. There's a lot of technical details in this plot to go from here down to here that probably I should not. <laughs> um, having to do with frequency versus wave number spectrum. But th this shows that, that we might even have a chance to predict some of the non-stationary stuff in a, a simulative system where the right eddy is in the model at the right time because you're assimilating it from data. Trouble advancing here. Um, okay, so um, I also want to show an analysis conducted by Joseph Ansong. So it's kind of interesting how these things all fit together. So um, Joseph was one of my best students when I taught him in rural northern Ghana. So what I like to say when I discuss this is that I had to teach him electricity and magnetism uh, in a school that did not have electricity. Um, so that made it challenging. I mean, I'm exaggerating slightly. They did have a generator they would turn on once in a while, but they did not have regular electricity. Okay, so he's back in Africa now, and he is now conducting an analysis of the internal tides in some of the biggest models that are run in the world. So I just get a real kick out of this because these big supercomputer models, the Navy one, the, the European Ocean Forecast model, the NASA model, the NOAA model, they all use a lot of electricity. And, um, but in order for him to analyze it, he has to have a good internet connection and that still isn't very good. Uh, but, he's, but anyway, he's doing his best analyzing them. And so here is what the altimeter sees for a map of the M2 internal tide sea surface height. And this is what the European ocean forecast model looks like. This is what the Navy model looks like. This is what the NOAA model looks like. And these are what the NASA models look like. So again, all these stories are a bit complicated, but the gist of it is I think you can see that um, the NASA model especially um, has very large amplitudes. See, there's much larger amplitudes than you see in the real world. And it turns out there's two reasons for that. Unfortunately, when they did this biggest supercomputer simulation ever, there was actually a mistake in the tidal forcing. It was a little bit too big. Um, so that will be fixed, you know, next time around. But the bigger reason is this, that these waves go out and in the real world what they do is they eventually turn over and break. But those processes happen at scales that are so small our computers are not resolving that. 
And so since they're not resolving the actual dissipation, I've been arguing for years that you have to have a knob in the model that's a, a little kludgy, you know, I'm going to get rid of that energy somehow, and you stick it in there. And if you tune it, as we did here, you can get closer to the answer. But if you don't have that knob, it's just going to be too big because there's real breaking processes happening that you're not resolving. And the reason all this stuff matters is that that $1 billion mission is going to go up in about a year, and models like the Navy one here, the European one here, and the NASA one here are going to be used to try to understand the motions. So it's actually important to try to figure some of these things out. And the last few slides I want to show um, some very high resolution regional simulations, so some words and then pictures. So one thing you could imagine when this satellite goes up is that um, it's going to be measuring things at really small scales. None of our global models can resolve those small scales. So one intelligent thing to do is to take a global model and use that to do what we call boundary forcing on a little patch, a little patch of ocean. And in that patch of ocean, because your patch is much smaller, you can, have, you can pack in a lot of grid points and you can have much higher resolution in that patch than you ever could in a global model. And so that's what we did in these last results I'm going to show you. So what we did, actually the way it happened was um, I was invited to give a seminar at University of Toronto. Professor Dick Peltier was there, and he said, oh, well, we're about to turn on Canada's biggest, you know, newest and greatest computer. Um, you, can, you can have it for a month. And so this is actually quite a gift to a modeler. You have a really huge computer all to yourself for one month. And uh, so that's, that's how we did these runs. And another kind of funny story about that is, so that my colleague in this, there's several colleagues, but one of them is named Dimitri Menemenlis, and he actually enjoys the process I'm about to describe. So when, when you have a new supercomputer, they benchmark it on really simple things, simple linear algebra tests and all that. And they'll tell you, that, you know, we have to do that, but those aren't real tests. Let's do a real test with a real model that's complicated. So basically, you, you plug your model into the biggest computer, and it'll run one time step, and then it'll crash. And this literally happens. And then the technicians will discover that there's this wire over here in the wrong spot. And they fix it. Then you run it again, and it runs a few more time steps, and it crashes again. And then they find the other, the other wire like that. And some people enjoy this, Dimitri being one of them. And um, so then we were able to get the model running. So we did one run where you're passing off the stuff from the global model into this box. And the box, by the way, is shown here. And inside this box, you have the same resolution as the global model. Then we did another run where we increased the horizontal resolution. So we packed in more grid spacing in the east, west, and north, south directions. Then we did another run where we packed in more points in the vertical direction. And then finally, we did a run where we did all of it. And so this is the gist of it. So Dimitri is really pleased with this plot. So this is, again, is a frequency specter of kinetic energy. The real data is in black. This particular thing doesn't go out to very high frequencies, but it's known from other data sets that the frequency specter should have approximately this slope here. When you run it at the same resolution as the global model, you're here. So that means that at very high frequencies, this slope, I hope you can see, is a lot less than what you're seeing here. And if you increase the vertical resolution only, you don't get much better. That's the red to the green. But if you increase the um, horizontal resolution, you jump up to this blue thing here. And remember, this is a log plot, so these are big differences. You jump up to this blue. And then if you increase both, I would argue you get the best result because it slides down at a slope that's roughly similar to what you're supposed to get, and it doesn't have this funny thing here. So without getting into the details, this is actually a form of aliasing in the model. It's because the model is trying to resolve things that it just can't do. It doesn't have enough resolution in the vertical direction. So if you have the, the right vertical resolutions in both directions, you don't have this funny roll-off here, uh, not roll-off, um, bump here. So anyway, I hope that you can get, you know, from here to here is better. That's the point, okay? And so when this billion dollar mission goes up, they're gonna wanna take models like this, and at least they can try to get down to really small scales in this particular region, and we've shown that that's possible. 
Okay, so to summarize, um, the realism of ocean models continues to improve as computer power improves. That allows you to pack in more points in the horizontal and vertical directions. And uh, in general, we like to think more resolution is better, although philosophical discussions could be had about that. Um, our work has emphasized models with simultaneous tidal and atmospheric forcing. And these models carry all kinds of motions, the large scale tides that are predictable, the internal tides that are set off by vertical motions over topography. Um, they also carry the eddies. The eddies interact with the internal tides so that the internal tides end up being partially predictable and partially not. Our models show all these things. And they have promise for applications, including a better understanding of mixing. So I didn't talk too much about that, but these waves eventually break and we at least are putting the waves in the right spots. So we're starting to think about where is the energy dissipating. Part of the reason that matters is that when you have breaking, you mix waters of different temperatures. So it actually matters for climate. And this is relevant for understanding of small scale motions in the ocean, Navy operations, including acoustics and satellite altimeter missions. So it really is big science, you know, billion dollar satellite missions, biggest supercomputers around. Maybe it's where you're talking maybe trillions. Um, anyway, so uh, I think I'll stop there. <laughs>